Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone, episode number 297 for the 29th of June 2014. Richard Saunders here from Sydney, Australia. Very chilly, but pleasant Sydney, Australia at the moment. Now, before we even begin to get stuck into this show and find out what's coming up, a major announcement regarding the Australian Skeptics National Convention in November. And I quote from the website of Australian Skeptics, skeptics.com.au, We have major news. After a great deal of negotiations, we are very excited to announce a ticket price reduction for the 30th Australian Skeptics National Convention. The new standard ticket price for the whole convention is only $260. Previously, it was $320. Effective immediately. Since we began planning this convention, trying to reduce the ticket price has been a high priority on our list. Convention attendance costs can be prohibitive, and we wanted to make sure that as many people as possible from both Australia and overseas would be able to attend. Now, after finalising the last price adjustments and overall budget, we're extremely pleased that we can offer the same event with the same wonderful speakers for less. What has changed, I hear you ask over the internet. What has changed? I did hear you ask. The only change directly impacting the attendees is that we won't be offering a catered lunch this year. This is because the convention venue is located in the middle of one of Sydney's busiest shopping and business centres, which is bustling with restaurants, cafes, takeaways, you name it, frozen yoghurt, all sorts of things. You won't have to walk more than a couple of minutes to find something for your fancy. However, good news, you won't go thirsty. We will be serving tea and coffee throughout both days of the convention. And even better news, yes, we are doing concession tickets. We are pleased to finally announce a limited number of concession tickets for pensioners and full-time students. The concession ticket price is $220. Really good news, and the news just keeps on getting better. What if you already bought a ticket? Do you get a refund? Yes, absolutely. Everybody who bought a ticket already will be reimbursed the price difference. Wow, more good news there than you can poke a stick out. Really, that's a funny expression, isn't it? Look, for more details, you can go to skeptics.com.au or better yet, go to convention.skeptics.com.au. Wow, great news for the Australian Skeptics National Convention coming up in November. If you've been sort of hanging out there, hanging off, not getting your tickets, now's the time to buy the tickets. The prices have crashed down. There are concession tickets available. Good news all around. And I'll be sure to be uh, <clears throat> telling everybody at the amazing meeting in Las Vegas in a few weeks' time that good news as well. But let's uh, let's calm down a little bit now. Let's just uh, take a deep breath. Whew. What's coming up on this week's episode of The Skeptic Zone? Well, here's a question for you. Have you got an embarrassing body? I sure do. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This week, a man who I'm sure doesn't have an embarrassing body, Iran Sagev, is going to chat to Dr. Bradley, who is one of the Australian doctors in the Australian series of Embarrassing Bodies. Now, for those of you who are maybe not familiar with Embarrassing Bodies, it's a show where people with embarrassing but sometimes very serious medical conditions come along to see doctors, and we sort of follow their stories and how they're helped or their situation is managed, and um, some cases are wonderful recoveries. Anyway, Iran's going to be talking with Dr. Brad about the show and some other <clears throat> embarrassing things. After that, it's a week in science from our good friends at the Royal Institution of Australia. Oh, who's on this week? Paul Willis. Dr. Paul Willis. Now there's a man with an embarrassing body. No two. After that, we catch up with Maynard. Now Maynard is taking a little break from Skeptic Zone activities at the moment to concentrate on his own podcast, Bunga Bunga. And we have a little chat about that, catching up with Maynard. Uh, wow, there's so much good stuff coming out of Maynard. He's uh, When he's not doing the Skeptic Zone, he's doing his own fun podcast, Bunga Bunga. Check it out at maynard.com.au. And we look forward to uh, more reports from Maynard when he's good and ready. 
And following that, I catch up with a good friend of mine, Bob Blaskovitz from the United States, who is hot on the tail, hot on the trail, on the case of one Dr. Brzezinski. What's this so-called cancer expert up to now? We catch up with the latest concerning news. Then to round off the show, it's uh, someone who's fast becoming a, a favourite on the Skeptic Zone, Joe Alabaster with more evidence, please. Joe's going to be looking at a recent study concerning rats and maize. Not 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 the maize you, you rats and mice run in, the maize you eat. The maize you eat, you see. Rats and maize. An interesting uh, investigation by Joe and a good lesson in science, I think. More evidence, please. That's what we want. More Joe Alabaster. She's coming up to round off the show. Now, a quick update from me on a personal project I've been working on for some time. The uh, upcoming documentary, The Vaccination Chronicles. As we speak, as I speak, as I speak to you. Yes, it works like that. I think as I'm speaking to you right now on Sunday night here in Australia, my good friend and sometimes co-host of The Skeptic Zone, Stefan Soika, is busy in his place, which is many kilometers from here, uh, finishing off the music for this documentary. I sort of wrote a little theme. I sent it to him because uh, he's a much better piano player than I am. And he's back and forth. Anyway, his he's little taste of it. Here we go. That's all you're getting. You're going to have to watch the documentary soon when it comes out. But uh, I think you can understand my excitement to hear that music, to put it on the timeline, to see it interact with the credits and the opening bit. and oh, It's all very exciting. Uh, and I hope that documentary will be out for everybody to see very, very soon now. But now it's time for me to run downstairs, run downstairs, open that cupboard, open the fridge, open the freezer, open the toaster, the microwave, and everything else in the kitchen I can possibly open. Hmm, I think I'll have a plate of toasted ravioli and finish it off with a pint of Ted Drewers. Hmm, sounds good to me, eh, Bob? While I'm doing that, or attempting to, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Let's all take this with a grain of salt. Here's Iran Segev. I felt something snap. Next day when I woke up, it was bent out of shape. This bedroom injury has left more than just a bruised ego. Oh yeah, you've got some cracker warts there. And whilst we're down below... Inside this bottom is a common household item. Do you want to try to pull it out? Dr Brad and the boys are gloved up and ready to dig deep. Brand new Embarrassing Bodies Down Under, Tuesday 9.30. Only on you. So I'm here with Dr. Brad Mackay, fellow Australian, who happens to be in the UK at the moment. G'day. Uh, hello. <laughs> Just proving your credentials, right? Exactly. Okay, exactly. very good. So um, we were, were talking actually, about fecal transplants. We're fecal transplants. So we'll have to jump straight into it. I don't mean that in a literal way, but come on. No. So, so there, there is a, a new fecal bank which has started up in the States. So apparently there's uh, three donors who are the official donors of fecal specimens. And so they, they will create their own specimens and then freeze them and then you can send off the specimens to different parts around America at this point of time and then defrost them and then use them as a fecal transplant. So doctors are starting to use that to help for chronic diarrhea and bacterial diarrhea. So when you say that doctors are starting to use that, I mean, first of all, something like this would have to be regulated in some way, wouldn't it? I mean, if well, that's the problem using it. because there's not much regulation for it. If you've got blood products, then that's highly scrutinised. Yes. Uh, but yeah, with fecal transplants, that's really like a very early stage, so there's no real rules for it at yeah. the moment. So they're saying that they've got like clean, like three donors that are clean people that are I mean, donating so, okay, their poop. Clean, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm this embellishing the, a little bit, yeah. but that, that's what they're saying. Like that, the, the the creme de la creme of bowel actions. That's the that's the thing. <laughs> um, so so. Three donors. I mean, you would expect that there would be a bit more of a variety, and, and plus, I heard 
uh, again... It's, it's like Apple making their, uh, their computers in a garage. Yeah. It's the, no, the, <laughs> like a, a small group that started up. Yeah, but uh, I actually heard... There's the, obviously, the faecal transplants have been in the news quite a lot in recent times. One of the things that um, I kind of gathered from all of the things that I've heard was that um, donation uh, from a family member is more efficient or more useful than just donation from a... From a well, I think no, that's no, still no. debatable. I don't think that there's much evidence for that happening. I think the, the main thing from having a family member is that you sort of like know that they're sort of like clean. It's not an anonymous donor. Yeah. So that, that's a safety in that regard. But is otherwise, that, you that, could get anybody. But they, they try to find... Sorry. Isn't that about uh, um, the... Again, we, we, one of the things we've discussed before we started recording was the fact that the gut flora is actually very complex, and it's different between different people. And I th- my, one of the things that seem to be um, evident is that there is commonalities amongst in, amongst families. So, for example, I and my wife and my children would tend to have similar gut flora, and perhaps me with somebody who's not uh, does not share my my life. Maybe the gut flora would be a little bit different, and then by taking gut flora from a, uh, or fecal transplant from a family member, you increase the chance that you'll get your original gut flora back. Or you could just get the same bad bacteria there as well. So there could, so could still be small colonies of bad bacteria in other family members' guts as well, and then that can be spread around too. Yeah. So it's not a, not a guarantee. You really, they're wanting to find people who have regular, like, 20, like once in a 24-hour period, normal bowel actions yeah. without having diarrhoea or constipation. So that's really what they're guided towards by saying that person has the perfect stool, let's yeah. get, get their poo. Okay, so now that we... Okay, so we got the poo out of the way. We can <laughs> That's talk a great about topic to we start talk, on. We, yep. can talk about, we can talk about other <laughs> things now. So first of all, um, can you... You're a doctor. You're a medical doctor. Yes. Um, and, but but you, you don't... Did you practice? Did you, are you in... Um... Yeah, I work in a clinic in Richmond in okay. Melbourne. And you do something else in addition to treating I patients. Also, I, well, I also treat patients on TV as well. Okay. So I do Embarrassing Bodies Down Under. So a very cheeky show based on the UK series. Yes. So it's been taking up a lot of my time lately. And we've just been nominated for a Logie, so I've got to cut off my trip early and go back <laughs> towards the end of the month for that. Okay, but so yeah. when, when did the, this uh, program start? Um, so the program was aired in October of 2013, so yeah. it was um, shown on Foxtel. Uh, now it's on uh, free-to-air in the UK as well. So and how many episodes have you? There's eight episodes, Okay. so each is an hour long. Uh, were you limited to only things from, from the belly button down, no. or just because it's down under? Or? Well, we were talking about hair b- earlier on before the recording. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, for, for example, one of my patients had terrible alopecia, so he looked like he was a monk, so yeah. he had a lot of uh, a loss of hair on the top of his head. So some people were saying, like, some people were commenting and thinking that it was a, like a testosterone-based androgenic hair loss, but his was an alopecia areata hair loss. And so it was uh, just quite amazing sort of seeing him, um, putting him in contact with a dermatologist who then did injections of steroid into his head and then, um, yeah, he had an amazing result. It was about 95% growth of his hair after having like a massive patch, like the size of a a large orange. So that sort of circumference um, all growing back with his hair. So you're needing to inject a very strong steroid dose into the skin to stop the autoimmune process from occurring. So it's sort of very very rewarding seeing those cases coming through. So have you encountered as part of doing this program, have you encountered things that you've never seen before? Uh, I think there are a lot of extremes. So uh, we did a fair bit of cosmetic surgery as part of the show, like a a small aspect of it. Um, One of my patients, she had a a large abdomen after losing lots of weight, and so that was quite a massive operation. I saw her before. Just skin skin removal? It was skin and fat as well. So she had about 16 kilograms removed from skin and fat together. That's significant. Yeah, so I saw her before and afterwards, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's good. And then I I was watching it when the episode went up on, on TV and I was like screaming watching the TV going, oh my god, the surgery's full on. So I, you sort of like miss that aspect of it if you've seen the patients before and after as a GP. So, so, so it's good to fill did in you the have to Did you actually have to do any treatments yourself or was it more the diagnosis and the 
Um, a, l- a lot of it was referral. talking to people, diagnosing, putting them in contact with a surgeon or a specialist and following them through with that. Uh, we saw heaps of patients, so a lot of the treatment options that we did were, wasn't actually shown completely. Um, so I had oh, you mean, so you mean reality TV is not really reality? <laughs> well, I'm just shocked. Some of the patients. Are, <laughs> no, like we, we saw about 140 patients altogether, yeah. and, um, and we had a, like a, a smaller amount of that. For, for what we actually showed on, on screen. So we had a lot of treatment. We had lots of psoriasis, warts, like a lot of bread and butter stuff for general practice, which mm. isn't interesting enough for television. Um, but, yeah, a good... Yeah, so now I have to ask you this question. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, it's a bit personal, but, you know, the, one of the things that the UK version of the show does is that it shows all these people with things that are n- not just embarrassing, but, frankly, a little bit off-putting. Yes. I mean, the reason they're embarrassing is because they're off-putting for totally uh, yeah. for not just the the owner of the of the, <laughs> of the situation, but also people around them. Um, the way the UK show mitigates that is by having very good-looking doctors. And I have, so I just have to ask you. I mean, obviously you're a good-looking you man, but, but but I have to ask you about your abs. Whether you have these abs that, that, uh, that the UK not quite does. as good as Dr. Christian's, but. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get there. Yeah, oh, okay. so you, yeah. he's okay. had years getting those abs. So I'm <laughs> just starting off now on TV. I see. Okay, so so you're saying it's the TV that does it? It's not exercise. Or... Totally, totally. Absolutely. But okay, self reflection. Yeah. Okay. So now the 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 show is on for for another season soon, or um, uh, we're we're still waiting to hear about a second season. So yes. nothing's been cleared so far. So I have no idea. We will okay. see what happens. And he was. You mentioned earlier that he was he was hidden uh, somewhere on on Fox. It was on um, the Lifestyle U channel on Foxtel. So a lot of people have seen it. A lot of my patients back in Melbourne haven't seen it. So they sort of come in and say, is your show on yet? Yes, it's been on. <laughs> it's been showing. Uh, but yeah, like over, over in the UK, we're getting quite a good following. Um, and yeah, being on free to air in the UK is fantastic. Oh, so, it is, oh, so it's free to air? Yeah. 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 Is that it's on a Wednesday night in the UK. Okay, <laughs> very good. And what, what channel? Um, it's on Channel 4. Ch- yeah. Channel. 11, thought, yeah. 11 p.m. on a Wednesday. Okay. So, yeah, Just prime time at 11 sleep. p.m., yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Everyone's on Twitter saying that they're having nightmares because they're watching <laughs> embarrassing bodies just before they go to bed. Yeah. So... Um, what are, what are you doing in the UK at the moment? You didn't come especially for QED. Of course I came especially for QED. <laughs> so, no, I've got, I've got a wedding, but this is perfect timing. Uh, I've been to the Skeptics Convention in Melbourne when that was there a couple of years ago um, and looking forward to Sydney later on uh, this year. Uh, but, yeah, like, I've been following skepticism for years, so I, I love the premise of it. I love the intellectual banter that goes on, and I love the kooky people and ideas <laughs> that come up at conventions We do not well. have kooky people oh, and sure. ideas. Yes, we yes. all agree with each other, and we're all, perf- we are all perfectly reasonable. Oh, totally, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, across the board with every uh, yeah, absolutely. Every culture. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, Brad, thank you very much for being on the Skeptic Zone. Thanks for having me on. People often tweet me and say, "But I'm too embarrassed to go to the doctor." Asterix blushes. Asterix. Well, this is a reminder that doctors have seen everything before. Even if it's rare, they've likely seen a photo of it in one of their textbooks. Get it checked out. And by the way, not all of my Twitter followers sound like Scooby-Doo. In a world where the truth is a matter of opinion. Where messages are received from beyond the grave. And reason is sidelined for magical thinking. Only three men stand between the truth and a postmodernist abyss. What date is it? Seven, eighth? Seventh, eighth? Uh, this is impressive. It's, it's, are it's, these artist impressions? They're not. They're photographs uh, of Chinese lanterns. It's not. It's not. <laughs> we are not well researched. Yeah, because uh, good uh, God, we're full. We of don't it. discuss cryptozoology on this show very often. Because we don't know anything about it. That's true. That is um, true. The price gets lower and lower and lower, and then he hits a ceiling. It's a ceiling from the room below. <laughs> skeptics with a K from the Merseyside Skeptic Society. Find us on iTunes, or you know, don't. Welcome to a week in science from RIOs, bringing you the science you need to know. 
How will the inhabitants of the most remote places on Earth fare under a changing climate? Not too well as we take a look at Antarctic wildlife and climate change. This is the tale of two penguins. One winner, one loser. This is an Adelie penguin. This is a Gentoo penguin. They are closely related and they both eat krill and the same kinds of fish. Over the past few decades, Adelie populations have been in rapid decline. During the same period, Gentoo populations have grown and they've extended their distribution further south. It looks like changes in sea ice due to climate change may be the key. Gentoos are adapted to sub-Antarctic islands where they forage in ice-free areas. Adelie penguins spend their winters in the pack ice. So one penguin's loss is another bird's gain. Newborn Antarctic fur seals are also feeling the pinch due to climate change. During the first few months of life, Antarctic fur seal pups are especially vulnerable to cold conditions. Climate models may show an increase in temperature, but windier and wetter conditions mean pups will have to divert more energy into keeping warm and less into growing up. This change will dramatically affect fur seal pup survival rates. Added to this, it is likely that climate change will affect the availability of prey, placing even more stress on the vulnerable pups. And now, four fast facts about Antarctic wildlife and climate change. Antarctic whale species, such as minkies and humpbacks, could lose between 5 and 30% of their habitat as the oceans warm. Leopard seals face an uncertain future as large areas of sea ice on which they breed disappear. Krill, the Southern Ocean's main food source, are in decline, with losses of up to 80% in some areas in the past 30 years. And the annual migration of killer whales may be severely affected by the loss of ice flows. Normally, they would follow these around the polar seas. That's it for this A Week in Science. For more information on Antarctic wildlife and climate change, go to the RIOS website, riaus.org.au, follow us on Twitter at RIOS, and like us on Facebook. I'm Paul Willis, and we'll catch you back here next week. Ad hominem, begging the question, factoid propagation, false analogy, false cause, false dichotomy, gibberish, immunised hypothesis, moral equivalence, poisoning the well, simple-minded certitude, stacking a deck, and WTF are just some of the fallacies we provide real-life examples of in Hunting Humbug 101, a podcast about bad arguments. Check it out at www.skepticsfieldguide.net. Maynard... What is Bunga Bunga? Bunga Bunga is the strangely weird project that the ABC Broadcasting Commission is not the slightest bit interesting in, so I thought Tim Ferguson and I should just go it alone and make a show called Bunga Bunga. Look it up online. It's a punchline of a joke that can't be shared in mixed company, and we basically take questions from the audience and are searching for a format. I mean, really, we thought <laughs> Mikhail's Navy, we'd do that, but no, World War II's over and we couldn't get a Navy boat for love nor money, so we thought we'd just sit at the Fru Fru Cafe here in Glebe, here in Glebe and just do some funny stuff and see what happens and episode three is coming out shortly we discuss all the important stuff like why liza minnelli is the only person who has anything good to say about the weimar republic why the dc3 in melbourne is known as the c41 in america and three people will think that joke is funny and uh, and tim basically explains his favorite episodes of comedy we talk about stuff it's skeptical if you like a skeptical show it's a skeptical show <laughs> if you love a show about a religion it's the religious show for you if you want a show that talks about the beeping noise that's in the background that no one's ever been able to explain, we've got the beeping noise show for you. And that's basically it. Bunga Bunga at Maynard.com.au. Have a listen. Please criticise us, because we love criticism. I think I'm going to criticise this, uh, <laughs> this, this little tiny truck. And it's got a beeping sound on the back. It's, why do these things happen, Maynard? When you, tell me, here's a mystery of the universe, Maynard. Oh, I'll go like, yep. I, this is one for all time. When I'm at home and I'm about to record the introductions for the Skeptic Zone, 90% of the time I sit down and say, hello and welcome, and suddenly... 
747. Yeah, well, you do live at a secret Air Force base. Well, I that think, does help. I think yeah. that's part of the problem. And the other problem is that your cat doesn't make noise when you want it to. Fred the cat shuts up. He does. Mm. I say, hello, Fred the cat, and he just looks at me. But in the middle of the night, it's meow, meow, well, meow, no- meow. Normally, he's the one who answers the phone. <laughs> meow, meow, meow. Yes, 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 Fred. Yeah, I know. Okay, it's tough living with Rick. <laughs> meow, meow. Yeah, could you put Richard on? No, he's, he, he just goes on. Man. Look, but what, look, look, it's Maynard Chopra here, and I've got the $10 <laughs> challenge for you. Really? Simple as that. Okay. Can someone explain to me pants? Pants go down, pants, pants come up. Who can explain that? There you go. Oh. Mix, mix masters. Who can explain that? Mix masters. Exactly. I haven't seen one of those for years. Where can you get a bulb for your fridge when it goes out? Who can explain that? I've got a $10 challenge signed by the Indian guy who runs a service station around the corner from me. A crisp $10 note. If someone can tell me how you can possibly replace the bulb in your refrigerator but, but, when it goes out. I've been you, throwing it away. How do you know if it's still on when you shut the door? Shh, no, that's not the important thing. That, that's been explained years ago. What can't be explained by these amazing people, apparently, and their cronies, and their cronies, the people that hang around with them, the people that drink with them, these people that, that call themselves sceptics. <laughs> they can't, look, if they can't spell sceptic, how the hell should they know how the universe works? This is Maynard Chopra in and out. Remember, there's ten bucks in it for you, people. Ten bucks. I'm being applying for that myself. Look, the website is maynard.com.au for That's right. all your Maynard needs. Yes, I'm there with my cronies. Your cronies? That's right. <laughs> as soon as I know what that word means, I'm going to do it. There goes that truck. No, it's a bigger one. It's quite exciting doing a bit on the side of the street, isn't it? This is why we do Bunga Bunga Live from various cafes around Glebe, except we have been thrown out of all of them except <laughs> the frou-frou. And as soon as we know what frou-frou means, we'll probably stop doing it there. Thank you, Mina. That's okay. Over and out. Ten dollars. Ein großes Hallo an alle deutschen Zuhörer des Skeptic Zone Podcasts. Wusstet ihr, dass es auch in Deutschland einen Skeptikerverband gibt? Für weitere Informationen über uns und das Skeptiker Magazin besucht www.gwup.org. Ich wiederhole www.gwup.org und unsere offiziellen Facebook, Twitter und Google Plus Seiten. And joining me now all the way from St. Louis, Missouri. I've never been to St. Louis, Missouri, but you know, one day I just might make it there. It's Bob Blackskowitz. Hello, Bob. Hey, Richard. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. You know what? I'm, I am I think I was just telling you before we started. I'm up at the crack of dawn. Well, actually, it's still dark outside. I'm trying to beat jet lag. If you can come up with a cure for jet lag, I will pay you a million dollars. Um, there's <laughs> lots of quack, quack cures for jet lag out there. But let's talk about something more serious, about more, some more quackery out there. And for quite a while now, you have been very active and uh, very forthright in your activities and online presence, especially when it comes to a certain uh, what you call the Houston Cancer Quack. And he's got a name which is almost incomprehensible and unpronounceable, which is Stanislav, Stanis, you see, I can't even pronounce it myself, <laughs> Stanislav Brzezinski. Now, just f- for those people out there who may not have heard of this man, Briefly, what what is he about and what are some of his claims? Well, he sells a cancer uh, treatment known as anti-neoplastins. Uh, they, are a, uh, they were originally derived from human urine. Uh, they're a fraction of human urine. Um, and he claims that they are endogenous compounds that um, are capable of, of fighting cancer. He thinks that... Um, Patients with cancer have fewer of these amino acids and peptides in their their, their uh, blood and urine. Um, however, no other you know, no oncologist on the the planet recognizes a lack of anti neoplastins as a cause for cancer. Right. Um, so he's the only one out there, um, and he's been he's been um, uh, selling this this drug and treating patients for about forty years. Um, for, did you it, say Did you say forty years? 40 years, yep, wow. since the 70s, it seems like, yeah. So, um, and in the last 15 years, uh, he's been limited to dispensing these uh, as part of uh, clinical trials. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, 
a child uh, by the name of Josiah Cotto died while on antineoplastins with a sodium level uh, that was around uh, 205. I believe that the uh, typical range is 135 to 145. Um, and uh, sodium is a uh, hypernatremia, uh, elevated sodium levels, a known side effect of uh, antineoplastins. And so the trials were suspended. Um, and in uh, just this past December, it really looked like the Brzezinski Clinic was was down for the count. Um, they were uh, uh, the subject of a USA Today investigation that ske- skeptics helped initiate. Um, they received a warning letter that detailed simply absurd levels of uh, incompetency and, and violations of protocols and inflated numbers, uh, inflated uh, success rates, um, uh, a failure to protect patients, uh, and uh, just a really kind of inconceivable number of, of violations. Um, at the same time, new proceedings were initiated by the Texas Medical Board against Brzezinski for false marketing. In the last few days, we've, we've gotten word that the FDA uh, will be giving Brzezinski the green light to resume administering uh, antineoplastins. So we're kind of surprised by that, and uh, we're wondering how that happened. So I was just about to ask you, um, how did this happen? But you're wondering yourself. Look, we, I guess over the years, we've seen a lot of strange decisions come from authorities. We can't quite figure out why they do these things. Uh, but I guess it it just means that you've uh, you're steadfast in your resolve. Yeah, um, I, I don't see any any choice, uh, you know, but for us to to dig in harder and and um, do what we can to see that the situation is remedied. We we really do think that um, this is a decision that places a patient at patients at risk uh, with no plausible benefit. Um, so and it, it turns out like this has kind of been a, a, a drip, 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 uh, you know, from the FDA over the last few months. I believe it was in you know, late March or April. Uh, the FDA announced that they were going to allow some patients who were campaigning to be put on antineoplastins for their incurable brain tumors, um, that they were they were going to be allowed to, to, to take the treatment as long as another doctor who wasn't Brzezinski, was administering it, and that an institutional review board approved, an independent institutional review board, not the the one that's been rubber stamping Brzezinski's treatments, um, signed off on it. And and thirdly, that they could find a, a, a treatment, uh, I'm sorry, a doctor in their uh, home state to oversee the treatment. And some patients have been able to meet that criteria. Um, and we just kind of were kind of nervous that that you know if this if the FDA blinked on on the these desperate patients that they they might you know fold when it came to antineoplastins in general and it looks like they it looks like they have an interesting side note one of the doctors uh who has been treating one of these patients recently has been very outspoken about what's going on in terms of the, of the treatment, he's uh, kind of surprised that his name is uh, Terry Bennett, a doctor in New Hampshire who's, who's seeing the treatment of a, a 12-year-old girl, Mackenzie Lowe. Her father went to uh, D.C., uh, drove from New Hampshire to D.C. to talk to the FDA because he didn't feel he was getting his questions answered. So the patients are really fighting for this. <sighs> At the same time, This doctor is learning what it means to do business with Brzezinski. He says that he feels like he's the bag man, the one who's supposed to collect $30,000 and deliver it to Brzezinski. He says it has all the the components of a bait and switch. Skeptics could have told him this, and we really wish that people knew what they were getting into before they get entangled with this Brzezinski guy. Well, I guess that's one of the reasons that you're so active um, out there. How can other people help? What are some of the websites you can direct people to? Um, I would recommend the HoustonCancerQuack.com. That has good information about how to boost reliable information into Brzezinski's web searches so that potential patients uh, see good information instead of uh, his propaganda. Um, And feel free to contact me at skepticsprotect.com 
at gmail.com. That's the email for the uh, Skeptics for the Protection of Cancer Patients group that I'm, I'm involved with. Yes, this is, I must admit, uh, for me personally, this is sort of hitting home a little bit because right now my poor old mum is uh, having chemo. She's doing very well, I'm, I'm pleased to say. But it, to it. yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a long process, of course, but mum's in good spirits. She's, uh, you know, hats off to mum. She's absolutely uh, sure that the scientifically based medical approach with chemotherapy and uh, listening to her professors and her doctors is exactly the right way to go. Um, and having the president of the Australian Skeptics as a son actually hasn't influenced her. You know, she she <laughs> she knew the the correct direction to go. However, visiting the cancer ward as I do uh, regularly now, I can I really can understand how people can get to the stage where, if a magic cure or a hope is dangled before them how that can, well, more or less override a lot of sceptical, um, what shall we say, roadblocks in their mind. Yeah, um, I actually had a, a very similar experience a couple of weeks ago. A family member um, who, who just died uh, got a uh, diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And I actually thought about one of the pancreatic cancer patients who I've met, who's still alive five years on, and wondered if Brzezinski had done something or what was it that this person had done. And I know that's not the way that you're not supposed to to, to go about looking for a cure is, is through anecdote. But pancreatic cancer is a bad one. Yeah. And um, uh, I understand that, that sense of just flailing out for anything like hope. Um, if someone throws you a line, you're likely to, to, to grab it. And that's what I find so reprehensible about the Brzezinski Clinic. Yeah, yeah, it, they're they're really playing on that part of human nature that that um, hope springs eternal. Well, let, let's think of something a bit more positive now. Uh, I'll be seeing you in just a matter of a few weeks at uh, the amazing meeting. Of course, are you going to be discussing this there? Um, I will be working with Susan Gerbic. Um, we have, I believe, it's on Sunday. Uh, we're going to have an uh, activism workshop. Uh, but I'm also going to be on a couple of uh, regularly scheduled workshops, um, the education workshop and another one that escapes me, ah, rhetoric and skepticism workshop. Right. So, yeah, I look forward to seeing you. Yeah, it, it, it's always great to catch up with the gang, as I, I call them, the, all my old friends and lots of uh, Skeptic Zone listeners, of course, and uh, I look forward to seeing you and, uh, well, of course, James Randi. Always good to catch up with James Randi. All right, Bob, well, really nice of you to uh, spare me a bit of time uh, in the wee small hours here in Australia as I (laughs) wake up early. And uh, all the best with uh, the continuing efforts uh, on this matter, and I'll be seeing you soon. All right. Thanks, Richard. Take care. Dear Skeptical Ninjas, my name is Jake Farwarton. And my name is Ross Bolt. And we are here to talk to you about Briz Skepticamp, which is coming up in July. So who is speaking at Briz Skepticamp? Well, Jake, you and I will be there as hosts. As hosts? And also recording a podcast. A podcast? Right. And we've got John Cook from SkepticalScience.com. Wow. We've got Theo Clark, who does Hunting Humbug Podcast, that- and also the Skeptics Field Guide. That is amazing. And Loretta Maron from Friends of Science and Medicine. That is fantastic. And if all of that sounded too amazing, we have a whole host of local skeptics from the Brisbane area. So if I call now, do I also get a free set of steak knives? Well, I would be quite sceptical of that claim, Jake. <laughs> so how can I find out more about Briz Skeptic Camp? You can go to brizskepticamp.org. That was an advantageously made web domain name, I dare say. Yes. And when is Briz Skeptic Camp? July 19th this year. So July 19th this year, and it's free. It's say. completely free. Oh, completely free? Yeah. With a free set of steak knives as well? I would continue to be sceptical. <laughs> so go to brizskepticamp.org right now. What we want is some more evidence, please. 
here's Joe Alabaster. Hello, this is Joe Alabaster. Well, up here in the Blue Mountains, it's incredibly cold this week. A friend of mine, Sheepy, who's been interviewed at Skepticamp on Skeptic Zone before, pointed me towards a rather amusing website a couple of days ago, homeaway.com.au, which contains travel guides for holiday destinations in Australia. The page that I had a bit of a giggle over is about Blue Mountains skiing, in which they claim that, quote, The Blue Mountains are filled with dozens of winding trails that are perfect for cross-country skiers who are looking to experience the breathtaking views of the Sydney Basin, end quote. While it's true that we do have many rather scenic bushwalks up here, we also only have a handful of days in which it snows, very lightly at that, and rarely below 100 metres. Cross-country skiing is not on the cards here. The website also states, quote, Skiers that are looking for a more thrilling and adrenaline-pumping experience can enjoy engaging in downhill skiing. Ski slopes in Threadbow or Perisher are just a short drive away from most accommodations in the Blue Mountains, end quote. Short drives are relative, of course, but Threadbow and Perisher are in the Kosciuszko National Park, near the border of Victoria, a good six-hour drive away from the Blue Mountains. I fear that snow buddies headed for the Blue Mountains on the advice of homeaway.com.au are quite likely to be disappointed. Anyhow, it's 4 degrees Celsius, which is 39 degrees Fahrenheit, just so that those of you out there who have seriously cold winters can have a giggle at me for finding this chilly. I'm all rugged up, and on to this week's story. Jilly Eric Saralini and his rat studies are back in the news. You may have heard of the paper which hit headlines in September 2012, compiled by a team led by Seralini, titled Long-Term Toxicity of a Roundup Herbicide and a Roundup-Tolerant Genetically Modified Maize, published in the journal Food and Chemical Toxicology. News of this study went viral, with claims that exposure to GMO corn and Roundup were shown to cause cancer in rats, accompanied by photographs of rats with huge tumours on their bodies. The impact was substantial, with widespread coverage in traditional media and high levels of discussion on social media, and near immediately, concerns over the study were raised by other scientists, criticising Seralini's experimental design, analysis and presentation of data, potential bias and the way that the paper was publicised to the media. First up, the experimental design. Seralini and his cohorts used Sprague Dawley rats in their studies, a line of laboratory rats which are highly prone to spontaneously occurring tumour development, in particular as they age under normal conditions. The lifespan of a Sprague Dawley rat is approximately two years, and the experiment lasted the lifetime of the rats. Studies have shown that the natural tendency of Sprague Dawley rats to develop tumours over their lifetimes are 70 to 77% for male rats and 87 to 96% for female rats. As such, to conduct an experiment with enough statistical power to determine whether there was a higher rate of tumours in the test group compared to the control group, at least 65 rats per group should have been used. In a highly criticised move, Seralini and his cohorts chose to use 10 rats per group. Additionally, they didn't blind the experiment, nor did they determine the cause of death of rats in the control group. This introduced bias, as the control and experimental groups of rats were treated differently. Information was not provided as to how much the rats were fed, nor whether there was fungus present in the feed. Overfeeding female rats and the presence of fungus can also lead to increased tumour growth. In fact, the raw data for the study was not provided at all. Some contend that this constitutes scientific misconduct. I've only touched the surface, and I should note that while I spend a lot of time learning about scientific processes, I am presenting the analysis of an undergrad here. For expert detailed analysis and criticism of the experimental design, visit Genetic Literacy Project's website at geneticliteracyproject.org. In another questionable move, the Seralini team decided to publicise their paper in a rather unconventional manner. A select group of journalists were presented with access to the paper on the proviso that they would sign confidentiality agreements, with penalties including, quote, a refund of the cost of the study of several million euros would be considered damages if the premature disclosure questioned the release of the study, end quote. Journalists who signed the agreement were prevented from contacting other scientists for comment on the paper until the embargo had expired. 
It disappoints me greatly that journalists would accept such terms, not to mention that any scientist would try to enforce them. Independent analysis is essential to presenting anything approaching an objective report, let alone advancing our body of knowledge itself. And the initial media reports on the paper were lacking in criticism that the study very much deserved. This lack of criticism, however, didn't last for long. Questions remain as to how this paper made it through peer review, but by November 2013, criticism of the paper prompted the editor of the journal, Food and Chemical Toxicology, to review the paper, including the raw data, and then retract it, after Seralini et al. refused to withdraw. Unfortunately, as we've observed in the case of Andrew Wakefield, even retracted papers can cause harm. Kenya, a nation which experiences troubles with food insecurity, rushed to ban the importation of GMO seeds shortly after the Seralini paper was released. As a result, investors have moved away from Kenya, causing economic impacts. Kenyan scientists and governors are currently lobbying the Biotechnology Task Force to lift the hastily placed GMO ban before it causes further damage. Kenyan Council of Governors Chairman for Health and Biotechnology Jack Runguma is quoted in the Standard Kenya as saying, quote, This ban on GMOs was rushed and not based on facts. Forming the task force was a waste of time, as there is nothing wrong with the products. Growing economies are using the biotechnology and their lifespans are far above ours. End quote. Closer to home, those Seralini rap memes and links to unreliable, uncritical reports supporting Seralini's suppositions keep circulating online. I tend to see them come up at least once a day. And to somebody who hasn't read the criticism, the images for those rats can be quite alarming. I see them not only shared by those who do so to support an established anti-GMO stance, but also by people who are undecided on the issue, but highly concerned by the claim that products that people are ingesting are causing rats to develop huge tumours on their bodies. The image is a very effective one in provoking an emotional response. Now fast forwarding to this week, Seralini's claims are experiencing a resurgence in attention, as a new paper has been published one which bears an uncanny resemblance to the old paper. This time, it's been published in a relatively new, too new to have an impact factor, open access journal, Environmental Sciences Europe, now titled Republished Study, Long-Term Toxicity of a Roundup Herbicide and Roundup-Tolerant Genetically Modified Maize. The abstract has changed somewhat, but the results remain the same and the same flawed experimental data has been used. Small sample sizes, tumour-prone rats. And again, an embargo was placed on journalists. The name of the journal was withheld until publication. Seralini told website Retraction Watch that this was to prevent GMO and Roundup maker Monsanto from pressuring editors to revoke publication. Another questionable point, potential competing interests, that perhaps should have been made public by Seralini. Seralini himself has released a book and a film about his research. It's also worth disclosing that Seralini, as well as being a professor of molecular biology at the University of Caen, is the chairman of the Scientific Council for the French Committee of Independent Research and Information on Genetic Engineering, a group who claim to present independent investigations into the safety of biotechnology, but only seem to prevent overwhelmingly negative conclusions. It's rather amazing that one poorly designed and very likely biased paper published twice, has gained so much attention. While I've acknowledged the harm that the Seralini papers have caused, I'd also like to mention a couple of positives here. The Seralini affair highlights the mechanisms by which poor science can be conducted, published and publicised. It encourages those who are interested to learn about how critical analysis can be applied to studies. And it can also serve as a reminder of what New York Times writer Andrew Revkin has dubbed single study syndrome. Single study syndrome is something we should all be aware of when reading news about developments in scientific knowledge. It's a mechanism which can trigger confirmation bias and is strongly related. A new study is released which implants a belief, suspicion or assumption which people carry and the study is perceived to have more weight than a single study should and its findings to trump the body of evidence which came before it. Unfortunately, journalists don't always present new studies within a realistic perspective, particularly when they sound somewhat sensationalistic. 
Until a study is subjected to post-peer review and replicated adequately, a single study shouldn't be cherry-picked and given more credence than all knowledge which came before it, even if it backs up positions which we, in our biased human states, are open to holding or already hold. Podcast Science is an award-winning weekly science show in French hosted by a bunch of crazy enthusiasts. We are convinced that the greatest ideas in science are quite easy to grasp as long as they are presented with passion, using a vocabulary common to all curious minds, whatever their academic background, if any. You don't understand French yet? Well, it's never too late. All our stories have a written transcript on the website and people from all around the world are using our content to learn Molière's language. Our topics range from zero to infinity, from evolution to artificial life, from electromagnetism to the science of introverts. We just love mathematics, science, critical thinking. So do you? Want to join? You can subscribe to the podcast for free from our website, podcastscience.fm, that's in one word. You also find us on iTunes and SoundCloud. See you soon, hopefully. Hâte de vous accueillir. À bientôt sur Podcast Science. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone and thank you for your patience for the introduction, where I waffled on a lot about the upcoming Australian Skeptics National Convention, my personal documentary, The Vaccination Chronicles, and whatever I waffled on about. But hell, it's my show, so there you go. And for those people who keep writing to me, asking me to do this, I'm going to do it again. This time I have a ten-sided dice, everybody, ten-sided. Put your psychic powers to the test. Think of a number now from one to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or ten. Use your psychic powers. Predict the future. I'm about to roll the dice. Here we go. Where can I do it? Over here. Ten. You want to try for a two? Think again. Here we go. Six. If anybody got ten, then six. Buy yourself an ice cream. While you're buying yourself an ice cream, I'm going to start packing my bags for my trip to California, where I'm spending a little bit of time before flying out to Las Vegas to see all my friends at the Amazing Meeting. If you're not coming to the Amazing Meeting, oh, and uh, I hope I'll take a leaf out of Maynard's book while I'm there, and I hope I can get lots of wonderful interviews for your enjoyment over the coming months on the Skeptic Zone. And, uh, well, it's not very long now, only a couple of weeks or so before the big episode number 300. And before I go, thank you to all those people who do chip into the Skeptic Zone via micro payments on PayPal at skepticzone.tv. Without your support over the last six years, good grief, can that be right? One, two, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twenty, six years, the Skeptic Zone simply would not have um, lasted this long. I better get all nostalgic in a couple of weeks for episode 300. I'll do that with Stefan Soika, the uh, part-time co-host. Ah, okay, you can all go to bed now. This is Richard Saunders, signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts, and extra video reports. <laughs>